Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Robin Dewey, Vice President Support Groups of the International Myeloma Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar, Top Myeloma Research Presented at ASH 2022, What Patients and Care Partners Need to Know. ASH is the annual meeting of the American Society of Hematology. On this live webinar, Dr. Dury, IMF Chairman of the Board and Chief Scientific Officer, will summarize key takeaways from ASH that impact the myeloma community. Additionally, Dr. Dury will host a panel discussion highlighting the patient perspective with Linda Hugale, IMF Support Group Leader of Chattanooga, Tennessee, with Nick Lenore, IMF Support Group Co-Leader in Brooksville, Florida. Both Linda and Nick were part of the IMF Support Group Leader in-person and virtual team that attended the ASH annual meeting. They both attended in person. So this brings together the science and expertise from Dr. Dury, along with that key important patient input. So if you've not yet access tonight's slides, you can do so as always at myloma.org. Additionally, to help you better understand some of tonight's slides, we have included links to myeloma terms and definitions, and also myeloma acronyms commonly used. You can find these links right below the button where you downloaded tonight's slides on myeloma.org. So here, of course, we're always very grateful to our sponsors. And for this webinar, the sponsors are Bristol Myers Squibb, GSK, Janssen Oncology, Cario Farm Therapeutics, Sanofi, and Takeda Oncology. At the end of this webinar and panel discussion, we'll take the time for your questions. Please send your questions by opening the Q&A window and typing your question right there. We'll get to as many as possible, but please remember you can always contact the info line at 800-452-2873 or by email at infoline at myloma.org. And it's now my pleasure to turn this call over to Dr. Brian Dury. Well, thank you, Robin, for uh, that uh, really uh, good introduction to give uh, uh, our audience a, a flavor of what we want to accomplish uh, during this webinar. And so the, the topics uh, to be covered are listed on this uh, slide, slide number four, uh, and I identified uh, six uh, topics uh, that uh, really were the most actively discussed uh, where there was the most expressed interest among uh, the attendees at ASH uh, with many sidebars and discussions and questions about these uh, particular uh, six topics. The bispecific antibodies uh, were, uh, I would say, the highlight this year, and I'll spend uh, the first bit of time talking about those. But uh, the uh, use of CAR T cells, the engineered uh, T cells from patients, uh, CAR T cells, the use in the frontline setting is, is pretty intriguing. Uh, the studies from Iceland, uh, pretty remarkable. Uh, there were actually 10 presentations from this one project, uh, the iStop MM project, Iceland screens, treats, or prevents multiple myeloma. Uh, led by Dr. Sigurdur uh, Christensen from the uh, University of Iceland. Uh, this is also a program that's supported by the uh, Black Swan Research Initiative. Uh, the ASCENT and the CSER trials, uh, it was great to see them uh, presented uh, at the same ASH meeting. Both of those are aggressive approaches to the treatment of, of early disease, high-risk smoldering myeloma, in an effort to achieve the very best and deepest responses and hopefully have a chance to cure some patients. If you're looking to cure patients with myeloma, the first step is to look at MRD, minimal residual disease, and to achieve a zero level if you can. And so it's especially interesting to discuss uh, two uh, abstracts dealing with uh, ultra-sensitive testing and introducing uh, the role of uh, mass spectrometry. 
I'm glad that Robin uh, mentioned uh, the glossary and the terms, uh, because as I go through, there will be some terms uh, like MRD uh, and the like, where it might be helpful just to double check uh, what, what, what are the meanings of some of these words. And I think from a patient standpoint, uh, the protocol from France, the IMF study looking at uh, a comparison where DEX was removed from one of the treatment uh, combinations is, is pretty interesting, uh, DEX sparing. Okay, so let's, uh, oh, first of all, um, we have uh, quite a range of resources related to ASH. Uh, and these are available here. Uh, I, read, uh, I wrote a, a text uh, summary of what I'm going to present right now in, the, in, in a blog form uh, that was posted. Uh, I am with uh, support group leaders uh, like uh, Linda and Nick uh, have their perspectives in the form of blogs. Uh, we also had a comprehensive symposium uh, at the Friday satellite se se uh, session. Uh, and uh, we also have done the IMWG uh, conference series, and there are ASH abstract summaries. Uh, one uh, abstract or presentation that we won't have time to talk about much is building dietary evidence for hematologic malignancies. So I would recommend people who are interested in the impact of diet uh, that they could uh, check this out. This was quite an interesting uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first topic, these uh, bi-specific antibodies, uh, and uh, this was, I think, the most uh, discussed of these bi-specifics, uh, talquetamab, uh, and it uh, targets not BCMA. When we talk about these antibodies that uh, target the myeloma, we're normally talking about uh, B-cell maturation uh, antigen, BCMA, uh, because that's the most commonly expressed. But now there has uh, come up interest, uh, if, if people are using uh, the BCMA as a target, what about uh, alternative targets? And so I think that's one of the reasons there was particular interest in this uh, G protein uh, receptor uh, group. Uh, and uh, with the linkage uh, to the CD3 as a bispecific. Uh, and so uh, this uh, particular abstract was presented by uh, A.G. Cherry, and I would have to say he did really an excellent job in explaining the different details of this particular trial. And so just to understand um, what exactly is this talquetamab, and uh, if you look at the diagram, over on the right, you'll see that this talquetamab has two arms. Uh, it has that uh, green arm, uh, which is targeting the GPRC5D target on the myeloma. And then it has the combo with the orange, which is targeting the T cell, which is in the micro environment uh, using this CD three receptor. And so by bringing uh, the myeloma and the T cell together, this activates uh, and enhances uh, the achievement of myeloma cell death in this uh, local micro environment. Overall, uh, the reason that there was such an excitement about this is that the overall response using this uh, type of an antibody has been in the 64 to 70% range uh, using um, uh, weekly or every two weeks uh, type of a schedule in this protocol with a play on words, uh, monumental, what am I, one study. Uh, this study was also interesting because it did look at patients who had had uh, previous uh, targeted uh, therapy. And so, uh, looking at uh, the specific benefit with this GPRC5D uh, uh, by specific. A particularly interesting and important part of this uh, monumental trial was looking at the overall response rate and the duration of the response uh, with 
two doses of, of this uh, antibody, uh, the uh, 0.4, which is on the left, and the 0.8, which is over on the right. And the interesting thing is, if you look at the response rate, you'll see overall response rate 74.1% and 73.1%. Uh, and then the duration of response, uh, rather similar uh, with, the, with the two doses. And so this is um, uh, quite important because it gives you some flexibility. Uh, if you have some toxicities, you don't need to be so worried that you need to keep pushing to that higher dose because actually the lower dose does have uh, a strong uh, efficacy. And then of course, the duration of response is out in that uh, seven and a half to nine month range all the way out to uh, 11.9 months. So really very respectable lengths of response or, or, or remission. And so the summary on the Talquetamab in this monumental trial, uh, very active, overall response rate 73 to 74%. And these are in heavily, heavily pre-treated patients. And in patients who had had prior T-cell redirection therapies, the response rate 63%. So very respectable with acceptable safety, safety and other uh, measures. Now, uh, there are special side effects with talcobetamab where it can affect the nails and the skin and you do need to be careful about uh, diet because uh, patients have a tendency to lose a little bit of weight. So you do need to watch out for some of these uh, unusual side effects. But as I mentioned, uh, dose adjustment uh, is possible without actually stopping the treatment. Uh, this is sufficiently well tolerated that now combinations are being looked at to see how well this could do in combinations with other drugs uh, like uh, daratumumab or imids and the like. But very impressive, 70% or better response uh, with, with this new uh, bispecific. Now, uh, there were half a dozen uh, different bispecifics uh, presented at ASH. Uh, this shows the, the listing. Uh, most of them, uh, as you see, are, are directed against the BCMA, the B-cell uh, maturation antigen, uh, a couple, uh, one the uh, talquitamab and then also sevestamab against another target, FCRH5. Uh, but very high response rates, uh, but uh, uh, the um, talquitamab really quite impressive. A concern, particularly with the BCMA by specifics, is the risk of infections. And so uh, you can see in the one column in the red box over toward the right, uh, as high as 68.1% infections. Uh, my sense was from listening to uh, Dr. Cherry is that the infections were less of a concern with Telquetamab. Of these uh, other uh, antibodies uh, of note, the AbV BCMA targeted by specific uh, does not require a step-up dosing, which is good. It makes it uh, more, more manageable where you don't have to come into the hospital necess necessarily to get that step-up dosing uh, schedule. So uh, th th this was a big area of discussion and uh, excitement at ASH, thinking about uh, these what are called off-the-shelf uh, products. So the big thing here is that you can go into the clinic and you can get the bispecific antibody versus the CAR T cells where several weeks are required for manufacturing. And so uh, this is a, a very attractive feature. So um, I, I'll be interested to hear uh, how our two uh, uh, patient guests uh, reacted uh, to this information at uh, at Ash, and so uh, maybe uh, Linda, you could comment uh, first. What what was your impression uh, about all of this? Well, it's very exciting to see such new ways of fighting myeloma. I'm a ten year, I mean a, a twelve year patient, and I've been going to Ash um, for ten years, and you know. The advances in that decade have just been amazing, and this is exciting. Although it is, from a patient perspective, 
you know, the side effects are definitely, I'd say, a bump up from what myeloma patients are used to. And there is, you know, in my situation, I would be treated most likely in a community setting. So I know they're working on protocols for how to administer this, you know, perhaps with hospitalization in the community setting. So those are all things that, you know, would be very important for me to research as a patient if, you know, if and when, um, you know, this became an option for me, so. Right, right. So very good points there. And, and Nick, uh, how did this strike you? So two things really stuck out. One was the ability to adjust the dosings. I mean, they had proof mm -hmm. that if you were starting to have the side effect issues, you could drop down in dosing where you wouldn't have to go off treatment. And yeah. two was was the OR. I mean, just in the highly treated, you know, patients, that's that could be some of ours, you know, our that have been heavily treated next Absolutely. step. So to me, it was just great to see what's next. Absolutely, absolutely. And I see the questions here. Um, it is given subcutaneous and there were schedules um, uh, once a week or every two weeks. Yeah, so just to answer that question. Uh, now the, the, both Toquetamab and the, and the BCMA uh, bispecifics, they have the same uh, um, activity where they, they both bring uh, the T cells close to the myeloma. Uh, in the one case, using the BCMA on the myeloma, and then uh, in, in the case of Talquetamab, the other uh, target on the surface of the myeloma. All right, so uh, very, very exciting. And I would say um, I, I, the, the, most of the discussion seemed to be, uh, th to give you an idea for this particular presentation, there were five overflow rooms of people who wanted to get in to listen to this. So it gives you an idea of how popular it was. Okay, so at this particular ash, CAR T cells. And so this is one place where um, the, that glossary could come in handy because I don't have time to go into all of the details about the CAR T cells, but uh, I will discuss it a little bit uh, related to one of the, of the abstracts. So not so much follow-up overall about the CAR T cells at this ash, uh, but I want to highlight uh, the one abstract where the CAR T's were given uh, to newly diagnosed patients. So very, very uh, exciting to see that earlier use of CAR T cells. So this was an abstract from Shanghai in China, actually, and it's a single arm study using a dual uh, targeted uh, T cells. So uh, th th what this means is that the T cells had two ways to target the myeloma. So it's not like bispecific where it was targeting uh, T cells and the myeloma because it is a T cell. <laughs> so, so this is a T cell that has a double uh, target directly against uh, the myeloma. And so this shows you here um, uh, the dual uh, targeting. And so the BCMA is on the myeloma and then this other target called CD19 is also on the myeloma and is expressed particularly in the early growing uh, myeloma, which what are called the progenitor cells. And so it's helpful to get more of the mature myeloma cells as well as the younger actively growing myeloma cells. And so this has the option to make this uh, potentially much more potent. What many people were very excited about was the fact that you could take the myeloma cells out of the patient and get that manufacturing uh, to prepare these specific dual targeted T cells within 22 to 36 hours. Now, uh, the comparison is with the regular uh, BCMA targeted T cells, it can take several weeks to do this. And so this is a huge advantage. When you have to wait several weeks, that means that you need to take what's called bridging therapy while you're waiting, which can get to be rather complicated. In this case, you don't need to do that. So it's a huge advantage. Plus, uh, since you're harvesting the T cells much earlier in the disease process, they're much better quality 
uh, and uh, there's an enhanced number of them as well. So the way that this worked is that patients with newly diagnosed myeloma received uh, two cycles of uh, standard of care therapy, uh, Velcade, Revlimid, and Dex, and then they went ahead and got these, what are called the FAST-T car cells, FAST-T car uh, uh, T cells. The response, very impressive. What can you say? The first 17 patients, overall response rate, 100%. Just amazing. These patients had a dramatic benefit when CAR T cells were used in this uh, fashion. And uh, the uh, MRD was also um, 100%. 17 out of 17 uh, had uh, MRD uh, negative. And then the traditional response was in excess of uh, 80%. Now, with early follow up, uh, the traditional response takes a little bit longer to clear the myeloma protein out of the bloodstream. And so uh, that tends to lag behind a little bit. Uh, but uh, very exciting to see this impact using uh, CAR-T much earlier in the disease. Uh, they decided to start with patients who have high risk uh, myeloma, where uh, new therapies are are um, required. Uh, so these patients, in addition, had like 17p minus plasma cell leukemia, extramedullary disease, other kind of high risk features. So uh, quite remarkable uh, to see uh, this kind of benefit. So um, I don't know if you guys had a chance uh, to um, uh, follow up on this. Uh, I believe this was presented as a virtual presentation. I think. So any thoughts? Uh, so maybe Nick, maybe you could comment first. What do you think about this? So going through CAR-T, I know that time from when you test to collecting your cells to actually going in, it, it can be a quite a long drawn out period. And the fast CAR, I mean, that you don't have to do bridge therapy anymore or anything like that. So I, I think this is all great stuff moving forward. Absolutely. And I see a question there. There was a lot of interest and excitement. You know, when can we get this uh, fast um, manufacturing to the U.S.? And uh, I don't know about that. I mean, but but that was one of the questions I was getting. When, when can we start doing this in the U.S.? And so don't know the answer to that yet. Uh, so, uh, Linda, what was your reaction to this? Oh, I agree that, you know, I think right now, We've seen people in our support groups getting the two approved CAR T cell therapies, but many wanting to get them, you know, that aren't there aren't slots for them. And I and from what I understand, a lot of that is because of the manufacturing process and the time it takes. So if we could, you know, speed up that process, I think that would open up more slots for patients. Exactly. Um, as obviously, you know, these results were just outstanding with the upfront patient. Um, we also did hear a discussion about another um, US-based um, called Next-T, which was also an attempt to speed up the manufacturing process. So hopefully, you know, there'll be a lot of competition for that and um, bring the best, uh, you know, to the market, to the patients. Right, right. And I see a question here, um, you know, how long are these responses going to last? And so the average follow-up on these patients was a, a bit less than a year. Uh, and so um, time will tell what will be the longer term impact. And so um, these are early days. And so we don't want to get ahead of ourselves here, but certainly initial results are uh, uh, very promising. Okay, so changing gears uh, completely, um, there was tremendous interest in this uh, one of the 10 abstracts from Iceland, and it was predicting the need uh, for an upfront bone marrow sampling test in individuals who have MGUS. And so uh, what, what is the, the story here? So in Iceland, they have been screening the whole population of Iceland over the age of 40 to see if they have a monoclonal protein uh, by electrophoresis and, and actually mass spectrometry um, in the serum. And it's been a, a huge, huge uh, accrual. Um, 
over 75,000 people signed up for this project. So you had to give informed consent for this. So this is the largest uh, study ever done where patients are signed up uh, for informed consent. And the reason for that is that they were randomized uh, to get standard of care, which we would be to do nothing, or to have a little more intensive guidelines, or uh, to really get detailed testing and even to be offered uh, therapy if they happen to have smoldering or active myeloma. So you can see that over 3,000 uh, MGUS uh, patients were detected uh, from, from this method. And so they set up this, um, it's an artificial intelligence approach to try to understand um, which of these patients who were screened would have 10% uh, or more plasma cells in the bone marrow. And, and so the reason for that is that if you have less than 10%, then you've got MGUS. Uh, if you have more than that, you could have smoldering or even active myeloma. And so if it would be predicted that you have less than 10%, then you could hold off on the bone marrow because probably you have MGUS and there's no need to rush in necessarily and uh, do a bone marrow and look for other things to be done. And they picked four predictors to see who needs a bone marrow. Uh, the isotype, if you look down at the bottom right of the slide, you'll see predictors says isotype, so that means the type of the MGUS, IgG, IgA, or biclonal. M protein, that means the amount of the uh, protein. FLC, that's the free light ratio. And then the total levels of the normal IgG, IgA, and IgM. And so those four things, they're all readily available tests. And I would have to say, it, took people's breath away when they said, well, what was the correlation with this method? Uh, and the, it shows it, the, the blue and then the dotted line, the, the actual and the predicted were almost completely overlapping. So they were able to predict who was going to have an elevated um, percentage of plasma cells in the bone marrow and those that needed a bone marrow test and those where you could safely uh, wait. And out of this, 366 of the patients uh, were determined that they wouldn't really need to have a bone marrow done. So a, a big, big savings for the patients and also for costs. And so uh, the Iceland team have put together uh, a risk calculator. And so uh, doctors and patients, they just need to load in their numbers and then you'll get your percentage. And then you can decide what you wanna do with the information. Now, if you're younger and you really wanna know, uh, you might want to do the bone marrow anyway. I mean, that's up to you. Uh, but if you're frail and old and it's uh, less than 10%, you might want to wait a while, you know? So it, it gives you that personal flexibility. Uh, so this is an evidence-based approach. It's a shift uh, from the group-based approach that has been used in the past and uh, really uh, could be an amazing way forward. Uh, uh, obviously, it does need to be validated by other teams, uh, which uh, I think will happen uh, rather quickly because of the uh, level of excitement about this. Um, so, uh, Linda, maybe we'll start with you on this one. So, how did this uh, strike you? Oh, I, I think the whole um, iStop project is so exciting because, you know, we all started out as MGUS and smoldering patients, we just didn't know it most of the time. Right. So, exactly. you know, I think that's just so promising for the future of, you know, early detection and then, you know, obviously possibly being more curable at that stage. So, you know, I was just super excited to see that, you know, the correlation between the actual and the predicted outcome and how strong that was and how that's moving this project forward. Thank you, yeah, and, and Nick? I I mean, the, the iStop is amazing and what they're they're putting out is, is great. And to be able to have a calculator that you can put information into and then you can right there start having that discussion with your doctor or getting the information you need to make your own right. decisions. That's 
that's phenomenal. And I, I hope we can keep moving forward with that type of that type of research because that's what we need is the information and, and, and how we want to be treated. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think that uh, I fully agree that this is not only important in itself for this bone sampling, uh, bone marrow sampling, but also it's kind of a model for the future. I, I anticipate that there will be calculators for a variety of decision processes, you know. So in a moment, I'm going to show you uh, the results with what we call the CURE trials. And so I'm sure that we will be able to come up with a calculator that will be able to tell patients, okay, what are the chances that you could be in that group that does really, really well and might be cured and then uh, benefit from treatment that is a little bit more aggressive. Uh, and so I do see this generally as a, as a way forward. Uh, so pretty exciting. Okay, um, let's keep moving forward. Uh, uh, I selected uh, these six categories, but there were a huge number of abstracts at ASH. Uh, and so just to be aware, I picked the ones that I thought were the most worthwhile for our joint uh, discussion. So uh, I think that uh, we were all very pleased to see the results of the ASCENT trial, and this is a US trial looking at uh, a fixed duration of therapy with daratumumab, carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and DEX, so a quadruplet, four, four agents for high-risk smoldering myeloma using the 22020 criteria. So the level of the spike two grams, free light 20, plasma cell percentage 20. So using those criteria to decide to give treatment or not. Uh, fixed duration, uh, two years. So the idea is to have two years of treatment, stop and see how well you do. So uh, this is just the 2020. There's also a scoring system uh, with, with an app actually that you can use. And the end point was to try to have that best response stringent CR or MRD negative. And so just to give you an idea of the treatment, uh, pretty intensive, um, the four week cycles uh, with an intensive regimen, that, then the consolidation and then the maintenance. Uh, you'll notice that um, the daratumumab continues through each of those segments, including in the maintenance out to that uh, two year uh, time point. And so the best response, uh, very, very high response rate, 97% uh, of the patients responded. Of those, 84% were MRD negative. So remarkably good uh, results. Again, the, um, the traditional response kind of lags behind that a little bit. Uh, also, uh, the uh, achievement of MRD increases over time. And not all of the patients have actually completed uh, the whole treatment so far. So that actually the MRD rate could go even higher with this particular protocol. And this just shows you that um, the, the outcome is obviously incredibly good. 90% uh, patients doing well out to uh, three years, and we, we obviously need longer uh, follow-up. So uh, this regimen is obviously an aggressive regimen, but it's one that's used uh, for myeloma treatment, and we didn't see anything unusual in, in this particular population. I would say it was a little challenging. This trial was going on uh, during the, the COVID pandemic. And so I would like to congratulate the patients and the investigators for coming through this uh, during that very difficult time. Um, and we'll be looking to see if that MRD negativity is sustained and if there can be a fraction of patients who could meet criteria of being uh, cured, which would be obviously tremendous. Now, at the same time, the CSER trial, very, very similar trial, where the patients received KRD, and not DARA, but an autologous stem cell transplant. So they got um, uh, the, the KRD, then they got a transplant, and then consolidation and maintenance. And so what was achieved with that? You could see the same kind of thing, overall response rate, 95%. 
you can see uh, the greater than CR, which includes MRD negative, 63%. So a little bit lower um, than what we saw with the DARA combo, but really, really uh, good. And so uh, Mary B. Mateos, on behalf of the Salamanca Spain group, she showed the, the length of the remission and the overall survival at um, 70.1 months, so basically uh, six years. And you can see, again, tremendously good outcomes um, at, uh, at that six-year time point. Uh, seven patients um, have died, to only three related to the disease, actually. Uh, so uh, we are really optimistic that um, this will be uh, a way to go. And, and if we can have a way to identify patients who are going to be in the very best groups, uh, that will be even uh, better. So I, I don't know how um, these results uh, struck uh, you guys. Uh, maybe Nick, you, you'd like to comment first about this this type of data. So the, the induction, the treatment, and then the maintenance, that was uh, just looking at the dosing, it was pretty intense treatments, but I mean, that's that's two years of treatment and to be able to get what close to 70 months is was what they're looking at right now. I mean, right. that's phenomenal, phenomenal. I mean, that's why we do this is to try to get more time. Absolutely, absolutely. And I see some comments coming in on the on the chat room. I mean, uh, obviously, um, these are what are called um, pilot studies. So they're, they're single arm and we want to see what can be achieved. Um, but uh, obviously, for the future, um, we can slot in maybe some of the, the the exciting biospecifics to make sure that everybody is MRD negative, and um, you know we can also look at um, randomized comparisons and things like that. And so this is uh, just kind of a, a starting point. Uh, Linda, what did you think? Yeah, I was you know encouraged by they included you know basically a duration of therapy and stop the maintenance after a certain time period, right. which is, you know, certainly a big question for patients um, with, um, you know, active myeloma or who are being maintained on maintenance drugs. So um, that was very interesting to me. Um, and I think would also make, you know, the rigors of the initial therapy more appealing to patients because they feel like, you know, maybe there is an end to it. Right, exactly. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, uh, perhaps um, a good way to entice participation in those types of studies. And then in the future, hopefully for, you know, non-study patients. Absolutely. I think that this is a very attractive uh, feature. I actually did a, a podcast uh, with the very first patient, a gentleman, who was the first patient in the ASCEND trial. And so right now, uh, he is about four years out, which means that he's been off treatment for two years. And he's MRD negative. He's still in a, like a full response. And I have to say, uh, uh, he wasn't exactly uh, jumping up and down during the podcast, but he was pretty pleased <laughs> to be off treatment for two years. Uh, that would make me happy. It would make me very happy. <laughs> Right. Uh, so I think that this is definitely uh, um, uh, an attractive feature. Um, we, we have a lot more information about these patients. Uh, fish testing was performed. I can see that. We have uh, uh, genetics. We have all kinds of information about these patients. And there will be more uh, to follow. Um, uh, some of these patients had uh, what you would consider uh, normal things that can happen to myeloma patients. Uh, one developed a second cancer, one developed uh, uh, myelodysplastic syndrome, MDS, things like that. And so normal things uh, can happen uh, in, in these kind of trial patients. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on. Um, so if you're trying to assess how good has the treatment been, uh, then uh, you, using your best testing for minimal residual disease to see are there any myeloma cells left in the bone marrow or in the blood after you've completed your planned treatment. And so 
This particular study looked at patients um, who were receiving maintenance in one of the uh, Spanish trials, JAM 2014 main trial. Uh, and so you can see here, it's a study that compares Revlimid and Dex, and then with the addition of Exazomib. And so then looking at the MRD, uh, and you can see the red arrows at the different time points looking at the MRD uh, in that uh, uh, period after the induction. And so the important thing from a monitoring standpoint is that they used next generation flow, in this case in the bone marrow, and then they did quantitative mass spectrometry, uh, QIPMS mass spectrometry, which is a very, very sensitive way to measure the level of the myeloma protein in the blood. And then immunofixation, which is the standard approach to measure the level of the myeloma protein in the blood. And you can see that the next generation flow in the bone marrow and the mass spectrometry performed much better in terms of the ability to see if any disease uh, was, was left. And so this uh, clearly was important in determining uh, the outcome of the patients. If you were NGF negative in the bone marrow, uh, you did much better. If you had uh, no spike picked up on mass spectrometry, much better. Immunofixation really was not performing well. And it's important to realize that this is what we do right now. Right now, right now is what we do is the immunofixation. So we desperately need to switch to these other new tools, mass spectrometry and next generation flow. And fortunately, uh, two commercial companies have bought these methodologies. And so uh, Becton Dickinson, a large technology company has bought the NGF method. And then um, the, uh, the mass spectrometry uh, has been available through the binding site uh, and um, this has also been bought by another large company. Um, so these will move forward to be commercially available, hopefully within this uh, upcoming uh, 2023. Now, the ability to measure using these techniques, particularly with mass spec in the blood, allows you to see if the MRD is sustained. And if the MRD is sustained, then the patient's going to do even better. And you see over to the right here, sustained MRD uh, with both methods, much, much better. So if you can do it simply using a blood test, makes it much better, easier, and it really gives you more guidance as to what's going on. Now, a lot of uh, uh, interest in uh, looking at the next generation flow test not in the bone marrow, but in the blood. And so this is Bruno Paiva's team uh, from uh, University of Pamplona in Spain, and he's looking at an ultra-sensitive uh, method uh, for uh, trying to identify myeloma cells in the blood. And so uh, we first aimed at investigating the prognostic value of MRD assessment in the blood, our second aim was to develop a new method with increased sensitivity. So to see if MRD testing in the blood was worthwhile and to make it as sensitive as possible. And so this new test, which is called blood flow, the blood flow test is ultra sensitive because uh, Bruno used magnetic beads to capture the myeloma cells in the blood. So to enrich and purify the myeloma cells allows you to have this ultra sensitive uh, detection. And uh, you can see that a particular pattern of antibodies was used for that, uh, but amazing sensitivity down to 10 to the minus seven, 10 to the minus eight. So that means that you could pick up one out of a hundred million cells, very, very sensitive. This means that uh, looking for myeloma in the blood could become a standard of care. This could be a way to look for myeloma in the blood rather than in the bone marrow. And this just shows you uh, that this is important. If you're negative using this very, very sensitive method, that's that blue curve. 
you do really, really well if you are negative at this 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8 level. And then down at the bottom, it kind of shows you the log plot of um, uh, who's uh, negative and who's uh, positive. So uh, very, very uh, exciting uh, couple of uh, abstracts. So um, I don't know uh, what your reaction is to having this type of very good sensitive testing in the blood versus the bone marrow. Uh, Nick, you want to go first on this? <laughs> I mean, how do you not get behind better results from blood than uh, bone marrow biopsies? I mean, that's, I think anybody, anybody's going to line up for the blood test compared to the biopsy. So I love seeing this. I, I am reading, looking at the slides, everything. This is just, this is the next testing. I mean, and the presentation was phenomenal. Yes, yes. Linda? Yeah, I mean, it is, uh, you know, like Nick said, nobody's lining up to get bone marrow biopsies um, very <laughs> often. But um, this also, you know, hopefully leads us to the sensitive testing to know maybe when maintenance could be stopped in the future. Right. Um, it also, I guess my question is too, you know, now when we make treatment change decisions, we're making it on less sensitive information. So how do you see that changing, Dr. Dury, as far as do we still, you know, wait for some of the typical signs or are we, do you think, right, right. so we don't jump too soon, I guess, to another treatment? Right, right, right. So uh, uh, these are, uh, well, that last point is a very, very good point. And uh, I do see our um, sort of standard recommendations uh, for monitoring and care changing in the next couple of years uh, where we can use these very sensitive tests in the blood uh, to better guide uh, treatment decisions. And uh, the, the one advantage is in the blood, you can do several tests. And so this concept of sustained negative is particularly important, which can be achieved in the blood versus having to do multiple uh, bone marrows. And so I, I do believe, and through our International Myeloma Working Group, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, different protocols which incorporate these types of analysis so that we can come up with new guidance, uh, new uh, standard of care consensus uh, recommendations. So uh, things will be changing uh, and changing for the better, uh, not just because we'll have the testing, but also because with the bispecifics, with the CAR-T, with all these new therapies, we'll have a lot more patients who are at that MRD low level uh, and where we will need these tools to see uh, uh, what we're achieving. Okay, um, uh, how soon are they think the new blood testing uh, will be available in the US? Uh, well, as I said, um, uh, Beckton Dickinson uh, bought the NGF method. Um, they're gonna be rolling it out um, uh, in this next year. So I think fairly soon. Okay. So changing gears again, um, dexamethasone sparing. So obviously uh, dexamethasone is the drug that myeloma patients uh, love to hate. <laughs> it, it can really uh, do a number. And uh, if we can get away from it, that's certainly uh, one uh, way to, to try to move forward. And so this was an interesting uh, French study, IFM 2017-03 trial where they looked at uh, a combo without dexamethasone. Now, uh, the, there has been tremendous excitement these last three, four, five years about what's called the, the Maya regimen, which is daratumumab, lenalidomide, plus dexamethasone. So basically what the study did is it took the Maya regimen, but it cut out the dex, and then they compared it um, to, unfortunately, they compared it to lenalidomide dex. Uh, they didn't actually compare it to the full Maya regimen, so you don't have a direct comparison, actually. But what they did do is, you can see here, they, com they compared uh, len and low dex with len uh, plus the DARA, and then they looked at the side effects uh, and the outcomes. And so, obviously, um, the 
len uh, plus the dara sub q was um uh, pretty well tolerated, although um, there are definite side effects uh, with both LEN and, and DARA, actually. You know, we're, we're focused on the DEX, but, you know, the LEN and the DARA can sometimes be no walk in the park either. So we need to pay attention to that. Here, the best response, you can see that the best response with the DARA REV, 96%, uh, 85% uh, with the REV DEX. The main thing I'd emphasize here is if you look over to the right, um, MRD at 10 to the minus five, uh, uh, it was 10% and 3%. These numbers are not nearly as good as those achieved um, with uh, the pool Meyer regimen, with the dexamethasone. So, so on the plus side, you don't have the dex side effects. On the negative side, uh, you maybe are not getting quite as uh, deep a response. And so uh, a lot of positive uh, excitement about this, particularly for frail patients, uh, safety very good. But I think there was a lot of interest in the last uh, arrow here on the bottom of the slide, the PFS analysis is ongoing. The, the responses were pretty good, but we need to see how long are the responses lasting and uh, what is the true differential in terms of benefit uh, by dropping the DEX? Um, you know, maybe there's a compromise where you could just have uh, a, a low, low DEX, uh, some sort of DEX that maybe could give, give you efficacy and uh, be, be tolerable. Um, so anyway, what did you guys think about this? No DEX. <laughs> uh, with DEX. Yeah. Learn with DEX. So, so Linda, what did you think? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, DEX is, can be, for me, I'm particularly sensitive to it. So even at a very low dose, I don't sleep. I don't have a lot of the other side effects, but I don't sleep. So, and I found in my group, you know, the patients that I would consider frail in this category, they do, like you mentioned, have more issues with the actual regimen and not the DEX. So um, I think there is, you know, it's great that they're talking about it, but I think there is a lot more work to be done, I think, on whether we eliminate DEX or like you say, maybe we just lower it um, to a greater degree. Um, I know there was a lot of action on Twitter um, during the conference about down with DEX and even for other regimens. And, um, it, you know, it it is something that Sometimes you wish your doctor took the decks and could really understand, you know, what it's like to be on it. Um, so um, certainly I'm glad they're starting to look that way. Um, I'm not sure that, you know, we're there yet. Right, right. No, I agree. Uh, and uh, as you can tell from the way I was introducing it, I think that you know, we just don't want, I feel at least we shouldn't just completely throw away the decks. Uh, so there was obviously a crucial study which was the, the four days of DEX, the high DEX versus the low DEX, the one day a week. And I think that that was crucial uh, uh, because we know that the one day a week of DEX can work. Uh, but even with that, um, that one day a week is 40 milligrams. And so there's quite a bit of flexibility. And in fact, uh, most doctors don't even give that 40 milligrams to uh, frail patients, they would start even with like 20 milligrams. And so you have some flexibility to come down from 20 milligrams, you know, to lower doses, even like eight milligrams or so. Uh, we do know that having some DEX uh, has an advantage over, over no DEX. So, so I think that we don't necessarily need to rush away from DEX, uh, but maybe individualize it. Uh, some patients uh, do not tolerate DEX well. Others um, uh, kind of like it. They take it on the weekends and get a bit of a boost, and uh, you know <laughs> they're not so upset about it. Uh, so anyway, I, I, I would recommend a kind of a flexible approach to to this information. Uh, so Nick, what, would you support that idea? <laughs> so I do see a need for Dex. I, I have people in my group that have been on just Revlimid. They started seeing their numbers creep up. They treated it with a little bit of DEX with their Revlimid, and they've started getting it back under control. Now, do they have to stay on DEX, or can right. they keep on there? You know, so these are all questions that are now being had. I mean, uh, yes, Twitter was a buzz, 
the whole place was a buzz. People were talking about <laughs> do right. we need decks and how long. So right. I, I mean, the conversations are being had, and I, I'm just uh, I'm thankful for that. Um, some people need it, some don't. Right, right. So thank you for that. So so what I'm watching is um, the questions coming uh, in on the chat box, and um, I can touch on some. And uh, Robin, if you're still there, you could maybe draw my attention to some uh, that, that could be important. Um, one which I see here is number 53, which is more uh, toxic, Landex versus uh, low doses of the biospecifics. Um, I think that the one thing we didn't really talk about with the biospecifics is that the clistamab, the BCMA biospecific, which is approved by the FDA, and we're just starting to get a handle on uh, in, in the clinical setting, uh, it's given on an ongoing basis. And um, one of the concerns is that we touched on is that um, there can be infections like pneumonia and other side effects. And so uh, what we need there is to think about what we were talking about with other therapies, maybe a, a fixed duration uh, with the biospecifics where you maybe take it for a year or whatever, uh, and then uh, try to avoid some of the other side effects. Uh, but um, overall, I would say that Landex is pretty well tolerated. Um, and we, we do need to look at... Um, the toxicities and side issues with the biospecifics. Um, uh, you have that step up dosing. So for the first week or two, the patient does need to go into the hospital for that. And so uh, the biospecifics are tremendous, but you know, uh, there are uh, some things to think about. Dr. So, Dury, maybe you want to look at number 49. Are we getting any can, you, can we scroll up to that 149? Um, let's see. So it's What's about stem cell transplant. And so thinking about using, since all of these other drugs in that relapsed refractory setting are showing such um, amazing results. Right, oh yeah. And we know that there are some of these things being studied up front. So there's a little discussion here about um, the the using stem cell transplant and... Mm -hmm. and right. Absolutely. I do think that this is a very, very reasonable uh, discussion. Uh, and I think that um, it's been sort of heightened by um, uh, the data coming out of the IFM study and the determination trial, mm -hmm. which was VRD plus or minus uh, autologous stem cell transplant. And so uh, the remission was prolonged, uh, but the overall survival was not enhanced with the incorporation of the stem cell uh, transplant. So this has raised this question about who should be transplanted and what is the full impact of a transplant. And it seems to be mostly if you can achieve that MRD negative. So if you get the transplant, you get more patients that become MRD negative. So if you look at it in that way, uh, it's quite likely in my mind that you could get a whole lot more MRD negative with CAR T versus a traditional uh, stem cell transplant. And so that's why uh, for me, the results of that dual targeted CAR T frontline from China was very, very intriguing uh, because it was sort of uh, pointing the way forward. And the Chinese actually have been kind of the pioneers and the leaders in this CAR T. And so I do think that um, that could be the way forward. And um, also, this kind of one and done approach, it kind of gets away from ongoing toxicities with infections and other kinds of issues. And uh, as I was saying earlier, uh, it's great to be off treatment. Uh, you know, if you, you're MRD negative and you're off treatment, you know, this is very, very good. Um, okay, so maybe I have time for one uh, last uh, question. Uh, anything catch your attention, uh, Robin? Well, a lot on um, revlimid and maintenance, and you know there have been. It's nice to see that there are studies now out there, and and there was one, Dr. Dury, looking at was it two, three, five years? Yeah, of maintenance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that um, uh, 
my own feeling is that um, if we can um, have a fixed duration of therapy, um, including the maintenance with traditional regimens, I mean that would be uh, that would be ideal if we could if we could achieve that. Yeah. I think okay. that study didn't yeah. show it needed longer time. I don't yeah. show that at this point we can make that decision. Exactly, exactly. But maybe with the MRD testing, with sustained MRD negative, we would have a comfort level to go ahead and stop. Yeah. So uh, anyway, I think that we have reached the witching hour here. And so maybe I can ask uh, our panelists, uh, I'm very, very grateful to you for your feedback from the patient perspective. Um, and maybe you could comment on just what it was like to be at ASH and then any other uh, final words of wisdom for for our listeners. Uh, Linda? Well, I mean, ASH is always ends my year on just such a high note because the amount of research that's going on and just the dedication of all the, you know, the scientists looking um, not only for new treatments, but for a cure is, you know, just amazing and really overwhelming. And I would um, hope that everybody um, participating or listening tonight would also check out the blogs um, that all the support group leaders wrote. Um, a lot of different perspectives, as Nick mentioned, a couple of nurses in our group, um, some who are smoldering, some who are more veteran patients like me. So, um, a lot of really good information and food for thought in those blogs. And of course, your um, final ASH blog is um, terrific as well. So, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to participate. Thank you so much. And Nick, some final thoughts? Um, just the whole experience to see what is actually going on out there in the research mm -hmm. world. I mean, as a patient, I've I've been on multiple clinical trials myself you only see what you're doing. You don't know what's going on out there in the world. And to be able to go there and see all the different advancements they're trying to make for us as patients, it was, I hope I can go every year from now on. I mean, and just see how next year is gonna build off of this year with the MRD testing and mass spec. And I mean, it's where we're going next is is really giving me hope and fighting this great great thank you for that yeah so thank you uh, uh to both of you and to and to robin uh again we obviously always thank our sponsors uh and uh really uh grateful that they uh, appreciate the value of this type of information uh, sharing uh and so for those of you uh who are uh, with us here, we we are interested in your feedback as well, and so this just tells you how to click and give us a little bit of feedback uh, about the webinar. Uh, it's a short survey, and so we will uh, really uh, appreciate that. And so, good day, good evening uh, from the International Myeloma Foundation. Uh, we appreciate the chance uh, to share this uh, uh, type of information with you, and obviously. Uh, we're wishing everyone the very, very best uh, for the for the holidays. Uh, I hope everyone can have a chance uh, to have a little bit of a break and have a careful time with your family and friends. So thank you all. Have a good evening. <laughs>